My name is Sharon Cassing. I'm a sister of Loretto. Um, I entered the community in 1961. Um, I've been in education my whole career. Um, small kids, medium kids, and teachers. Um, and loved every minute of it. There you go. I think I was always destined for religious life, but um, it wasn't until I met the Sisters of Loretto that it became real for me. I, I went to um, Spark Hill Dominicans in grade school and I loved them dearly, but the call wasn't there. And so it came later and, and I guess, you know, I'm sure you've heard this from lots of people, but it was, it was how Loretto sisters interacted with one another that um, pulled me in. They, they seldom seemed artificial. They, they even were silly every once in a while. Um, they were absolutely the best educators I could have ever hoped for. Um, and they provided me with a, a grounding in things that I thought were good for me as a young woman. And, um, and it hasn't let me down. <laughs> We were in the novitiate when Luke was chosen to go to Rome. And I was thinking about it yesterday, and I don't think most of us really understood what um, a unique invitation that was. We just thought it was really cool that our Superior General got to go. <laughs> I don't think I even knew that she was head of LCWR or, or you know, any of that kind of stuff at the time. and. Um, and so we, we longed to hear her letters when she would send them back. And then when she finally uh, came home, you know, we, as second years, we had class with her every Sunday. And it was, I mean, the dust wasn't dry on the, uh, on the runway at the airport when we got our first copy of the document from the Constitution of the Church. And she taught the class. So, I mean, you know, you just, I was slack job most of the time trying to, to pull it all in. Um, but I was really young and um, I didn't see the, the big implications of that until later. And um, I remember not long after I was out of the House of Studies, I went to um, a little program on the Psalms that Father Carol Stallmuller gave at the Senegal here in St. Louis. And um, because he was such good friends with, friends with Sister Helen Jean, we got kind of his ear privately afterwards. And I can remember him saying at that very early time how dis disappointed he was that women weren't, um, weren't being included in those reforms as an action, as a real act on the part of the church. And then again, when I was at St. John's in the 90s, um, Godfrey Dietman was there, and he, he was actually at the council as, as a, uh, what they call him, Pariti. And, um, and again, I was lucky enough to get in a conversation with him. And he was, this was like in 1995 or 96, and he was terribly distressed by the, uh, the pushback against Vatican II at that time. And um, because they had just um, taken off the imprimatur on, on all the work that ISIL had done, the International Commission on English in the Liturgy, they had repudiated all those beautiful translations and he was a part of that. And, and it was, all I could think of was he was nearing the end of his life. He died like two years later. And, and there was this heavy sadness on his heart. And I was mad at the time because I just loved the translations and, you know, and they've gotten even worse, so, but we won't go there. Um, but um, in my own life, having worked primarily in, in parishes, 
Um, I got to see some nice changes. You know, we got to see the, the emergence of parish councils and um, study groups. In the parishes, we got to see some, and I guess we were lucky that we had some good priests, you know, who paid attention to what was happening in Vatican II and, and the outcome of it. And there were, as I said, the parish councils emerged. Um, there were more deacons, but, you know, that wasn't always a good answer, but um, in, the, in the school, we, we had great liturgies with the kids, and I felt like we were um, incorporating to the maximum. The, in, as far as you know, 10-year-olds are concerned, they, they knew how to behave at church in all the ministries, and it was great um, to have kids that involved and to understand why they were doing it and what they were doing. Um, it, gradually I started, because I played guitar and was involved in liturgies at, at uh, St. Pius primarily, um, I started, I decided to work for a degree in liturgical studies. And the funny thing was I knew I would never, I, I would never be able to make a living at it, you know, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I play guitar, I don't play organ. I'm not a musician, I'm not trained in music, and I'm a woman. <laughs> and this was St. Louis, Missouri. And so what I ended up feeling like was that I got a six year summer retreat, mm -hmm. you know. So it was a wonderful, and I think I've used it um, with the community, but, uh, and, I, and I'm happy with that part, you know, I like that part. Um, in community, I lived at the Lockwood. I tend to stay in one place for a really long time. <laughs> so I lived at Visitation until it closed, and then I lived at the Lockwood House till it closed, and then <laughs> like that. Um, we never had a superior at, at the Lockwood House. We had one at Visitation. And um, somewhere in between there, it changed. And when I, after I moved to the Lockwood House, there, there was not a superior. And so we, I think, you know, for a big, we were 13, 14 people, for a big community, we did pretty well. Um, of course, it, there's the beauty of the house, too. It was a house that could absorb a lot. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, you know, if you're having trouble with somebody, um, it's a good thing to, to be able to go someplace and be someplace to, re, to revamp and, um, Anyway, um, as far as my choices to work, I taught for 29 years in the Catholic schools in St. Louis. And when the 29th year started in September of that year, I knew something was really wrong because I couldn't get my classroom ready. <laughs> I was throwing stuff in boxes the day before the kids came. And that isn't normally how it goes. And um, about October of that year, it just became really clear to me that I needed to stop teaching. And um, once I made the decision, I ended up having the best teaching year of my career. It, it was like, I decided in October that this was to be my last year. And by May, it, it was the end of a really good year. And I still keep in touch with a lot of my students and families from St. Pius. I go down there regularly for mass. Um, anyway, so that year, I didn't know what I was gonna do then because I was like 55 I think, years old. And I didn't know what I was gonna do, I had not a clue. But I had always used the St. Louis Zoo as a resource in my classroom, taking my kids there many times, um, either for uh, classes or for my own um, experiments with them. So I answered an ad in the, in the St. Louis Post Dispatch and went and doggone, didn't I get hired? So I worked for five years as an instructor at the zoo. That meant teaching all the little kids that came in for class. But at year five, I had just about scraped my creativity barrel dry. And I, it, for a teacher, that's really hard to continue at that point. Um, we were teaching 1,300 classes in May. 
and that was <laughs> four of us. And so you didn't know who you were talking to and you didn't know where the animals belonged and people would say, you showed us that animal already. And so I knew it was time to quit. So I, I barely quit and they asked me to come back and do a different job. So that's when I got into teacher work. And now, you know, that was, that was the best way in the world to go out because I really enjoyed working with them. I, I gained a new love and respect for especially public school teachers who have to put up with so much to do a halfway decent job. Um, it's almost impossible for them to do their best job because they have so many expectations on them otherwise. So that was the last part. And, you know, um, I remember very early on when people were starting to move more into social justice kinds of um, ministries, I remember thinking, I'm just a teacher. And I felt bad about that. I, uh, for a number of years, I had, to, I had to say to myself, that's good for you. <laughs> um, but it was hard because everybody else was doing everything else. And luckily about that time, I discovered I was fairly good at it. And um, I remember somebody coming up to me and saying, I'm so glad you're a teacher. I could never do that. And that's what I have been saying about the other. I'm so glad you do social justice work because I can't do that. <laughs> so it was real helpful to me to know that I was doing something somebody else wished they could do. <laughs> so I taught until the money ran out. It was a grant funded program. When the money was gone, the job was over. So that's it. I started to feel that freeing when I was a, what, a junior at Webster, I guess, because I wanted to change my major from, a, from chem, biology to chemistry. And I expected all kinds of complications because I would have to stay another semester. And, and I remember walking in and with Sister Mary Roger to see Sister Helen Sanders, and the two of us sit down and Helen Sanders says, well, what, what are you here for? And I said, well, and I'm stammering around. I said, I'd really like to change my major. And she says, well, okay, what, what, tell me about it. But it was, all, I already had permission before I'd even said anything, you know. And then ever after that, anything I wanted to do when I went for my master's, both times, it was all up to me to do, you know. And um, I, I just remember thinking, I'd come from a family where my family had always encouraged me to do what I needed, you know, the best way to use my talent. And so it was wonderful and freeing to know that the same thing was happening in community. And I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to be made to teach something I had no background, inclination, or desire to do. <laughs> I was going to, they were going to look at my talents, see what worked best, and that's where I would go. And I would choose. I, I really think even those people who objected to some of the changes were pushed to new limits that were good for all of us. And um, I mean, I think I remember an incident, Anna, when you were at Loretto and you had on some flowered pants, maybe in the 70s or so. And either Candida or Theodosia came up to you and said, I bet you scared the bears with those. You remember that? No. I do. I do remember other comments. But I mean, even, even somebody who was thoroughly in the habit still and coherent and everything else could, could still love us. Mm -hmm. Could still love us even if we were on what they would consider the fringe. Mm -hmm. um, that, that to me was always um, special. Well, the thing, the thing that, and this is true of history, you know, the thing that saddens me is 
um, young people today have no sense of that excitement that we felt. And there's no, um, and it, it's not their fault. There's no personal investment in a story that's unfolding. And so um, they get all their information secondhand, sort of. And it's hard to talk to people secondhand. I mean, it's hard to convey any kind of enthusiasm to people who, who don't have a foundation like we do. So I, I find that hard. Um, um, for myself, one of the biggest things that came out of Vatican II, and it wasn't until I was studying at, at St. John's, and, and even more of late in the readings I've been doing, is the importance, the complete importance of your baptismal commitment. That, it, that your commitment starts at baptism and you're not off the hook till you die, you know? And it doesn't, it doesn't get more or better as you get older, it's, it's the same amount. And, and so to um, invest yourself at any point in your life, it has to be your whole self. And um, so I guess that awareness of baptismal commitment and that it's the same for all people who are baptized. I'm no better, no worse than anybody else. And at the zoo, people used to come up to me and they'd say, and they'd call me sister then. They never called me sister, but they'd come up to me and they'd say, Sister Sharon, I have something I need you to pray for. And I said, I always said, I don't have any more clout than you do. <laughs> I said, I'll do it. I'll be happy to do it. I said, but you got to do it too. You know, it's, it's, it's not something that I have a handle on better than anybody else. Um, that was one thing I loved about working at the zoo. They didn't have any preconceptions about nuns. So I went in there kind of just like a regular old employee, you know, and then all of a sudden they discovered a few things and I was sort of the pastoral associate at the St. Louis Zoo. Mm -hmm. It all started when we, a bunch of us got both in the community and, and out who had left, got together in the Ozarks um, one summer at somebody's summer place. And we started telling stories and it was just hysterical. Partly, and then, and then there were some real tears because we heard some really sad stories about people. And out of it, somebody, some one of them, of us, who was sort of an academic, you know, and apparently puts more uh, stock in publishing, suggested that we write a, a memoir. And so that we started batting that around. And then the next summer we went again to the Ozarks and there were other people there and um, I, I personally didn't like the idea of a memoir. I wanted it to include just what we've been talking about here. What influence did our time, our, our precious time at Loretto as young women, at that time in the history of the, of the country, that time in the history of the church, what effect did that have on our lives? And so that's the question we ask people. And we heard from almost every single person in the class. And so um, we, we divvied up the pieces, you know, and, and somebody wrote, or pairs of people wrote different parts of it. And, um, and Jane Peckham, who worked for the National Catholic Reporter and who's a, who can even tell when your italics are uh, on, a, on a quote, she can tell you that you need to um, dismiss the italics because it's, it's not, you know what I'm saying? She could tell when the, when the italics were pointing too much. Uh, that's how good she is as an editor. But um, it's funny that you should ask about that because in the last three, four days, I've gotten maybe 12, 15 emails from members of my class all our bond is so much tighter because of the work we did together on that book. And we're talking about another trip to the Ozarks. I don't think there's a book in it, but, <laughs> um, but it's really been a wonderful um, reassociation with people 
who very obviously were formed by Loretto and are pleased about it. Now, two summers ago, I went to um, Sandra Schneider's uh, talk at, at Notre Dame on her third book. And, and it was very good, well spent time. Um, but when I got home, I thought, I bet she'd enjoy a copy of Patchwork, Voices from Silence. So I just put it in an envelope and told her as much, thinking I'd never hear from her again. And so within like two weeks, I get this nice little note back from her that said how much she appreciated our book, how um, we had done such a good job of capturing what it was like to be a young religious in the Catholic Church in the 60s, in the shadow of Vatican II, and she said, and what she appreciated the most was that we had shown the shadow as well by including the chapter on leave taking. Oh, yeah. And, um, and that was the last chapter we added after we had planned the whole book. Uh, but I thought that was really something for her to send that to us and, and to say those things because we, we thought the book was incomplete without the chapter on leave taking. Yeah. I don't think that had anything to do with Vatican II. I think it had to do with the fact that people realized that there were other ways for them to give their gift. And that maybe marriage was in the picture, or maybe um, they didn't, in my class particularly, there were a number of people who wanted to go right on to graduate school, and that wasn't a possibility at that point. And so some of them left for, to go to graduate school. Um, but I, I don't I see it as related to Vatican II. Um, maybe, maybe the way they went and talked to the superior, <laughs> they've been freed up a little bit by the atmosphere, I don't know. Well, I lived for 42 years in, in what? In community. Um, either at Visitation Holy Ghost or at the Lockwood House. Yeah. Um, and the reason I'm, I moved out of that situation was because the house got too big for one thing, for a, the four, we were down to four, but um, so I moved into smaller groups for a while, but it, it occurred to me that I needed to honor my own hermit. I have, I had a, I had a call to be more in solitude. And so I did, but you know, it's, it's interesting that you bring it up. I worry about it now because, well, because of, of our own diminishment and the loss of the centers, which are hubs for local activity, and, um, and, and wonder where am I gonna find the community that, um, that I could always count on at a center. Um, I would, I've been very much involved at the center here in St. Louis. So, and I always count it my worshiping community, but uh, you know, that's all gonna change in a year or so. And, um, and I'm, I'm concerned about that, I really am. Well, the community mm -hmm. itself is gonna have to look different. Um, it's, it, it already is broader than the Loretto community, but it's gonna to have to be intentionally broader and more consistently nurtured. Um, as far as, as worship, I already know where I'm going, I'm going back to St. Pius, which uh, as a community, um, it's, it's the most wonderfully diverse group of parishioners I've ever seen. I was there just this past Sunday and um, you could count 15 or 20 nationalities just in the, in the worshiping community that you knew of, you know, and um, plus everybody sings and everybody knows everybody. So that's gonna be, you know, as long as I'm able to do that, that's well, and uh, I'm sure. But, it's, but the other things, you know, like, um, our women's liturgy group was talking about it just Sunday, you know. We're down to six from 11 or 12. 
and um, not everybody has died, but some have gone to Loretto and that kind of thing. And, you know, what do we do? To, because we're going to lose one or two more soon. And uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to uh, find that stimulation, that kind of uh, uh, desire to be together that pulls us to it? And it's only once a month, you know, so, um, but it, it matters. And so I want to figure out, so we were talking about it and um, I think it's going to be a conversation that will continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking of things I'm reading lately that yeah. you might like or somebody else might like. Mm -hmm. One is Ken Wilber's No Boundary. One or two are Jim Wallace's Uncommon Good and America's Original Sin. Jim Wallace's? Jim Wallace. Yeah. Um, Sojourners. Mm -hmm. um, he's got one called Uncommon Good. And then he has another one more recently called um, America's Original Sin, and it's on white privilege. And then what else? Maybe? Yeah, I think that's it. I, I can't imagine. I mean, I think the only way you can get an answer to that question is to ask the people who are coming. Because um, I think, I can't think of anything we haven't put out there. <laughs> you know? um, I do think stories are important. I was, um, I, I've always been terribly jealous of Susan and Joanne and the work they do with young people, the volunteers, how they come to their house and all that. So when Susan was here the last time in St. Louis, we invited some of the volunteers over to my house. And um, it was great fun. I mean, it was, um, there were six or seven of them there. One, two, six, seven, yeah. And, um, and what made me feel so good was, um, the question was sort of asked, you know, what would be missing? If, if you, you weren't involved in this program. And, and one, two of them said, and three or four agreed, that one of the things they prize most is the intergenerational friendships. And that made me feel so good because I thought, well, they are paying attention, <laughs> you know? Um, and so anything, I mean, as far as young people especially, anything we can do to encourage uh, a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two relationship. You know, I've, I've always said I'd be a pen pal in a minute or a Zoom pal or whatever kind of pal, you know, or um, because I do think that's where, where the rubber meets the road is one-on-one -on -one and, um, and just um, a continuation of that, a building of it. You know, one of the things we said in our liturgy group the other day was that we're, we've been together for 12 years, and there's nothing we can't say to one another. And that's part of the problem, because to bring somebody new in, you have to kind of start over, or you have to take a tremendous leap of faith. And, um, and I guess that's probably what we're going to have to do. <laughs> but um, any of those kinds of things where people can continue to meet as um, long as we're able. It's a, it's a strange time. <laughs> I, I think it's, but I, I keep going back to, um, in one sense, it's absolutely no different. And I say this because I'm from Missouri. It's no different from the Sisters of Loretto leaving Loretto Mother House and going to Perryville, Perryville, Missouri, which was their first venture beyond, you know. So, you know, if they can do it, we can do it. <laughs> 